with this topic for many years now. Um, and we are glad and proud that National Endowment for Democracy, among other partners, uh, are super supporting us in this endeavor, not uh, in every sense, even with expertise and, and, and a lot of good contacts. Thanks for our speakers for being us today. Um, after my introduction, I will turn to my colleague, Patrick Siherle, who will introduce the results of our empirical study. And then uh, Kevin Shives from National Endowment for Democracy will be introducing some thoughts on the transatlantic aspects of fighting against authoritarian influence. And then we will have a round table with a group of esteemed members of the European Parliament who, according to our opinion, and also our figures that we will show to you, represent the best side of the European Parliament in terms of resisting authoritarian influence. Uh, last year, we concluded in our study that the European Parliament is somehow the conscience uh, of the European Union. Conscience, as we know, not always drives the behavior, but at least creates some guilt when it doesn't. And we think that they represent this conscience of the uh, European Union in the best sense. Uh, we will have in the round table uh, Reinhard Bütikofer with us uh, from Germany, uh, from the Green Group. Um, we will have also uh, Katalin Cha from Hungary, uh, from uh, Momentum and Renew Europe, uh, and also Radan Kana from Bulgaria, um, from the European People's Party and Democrats for Strong Bulgaria. So without further ado, uh, I would like to give the floor to my colleague, uh, Patrick Siherla, who will introduce uh, the results of the study that we, um, we were preparing uh, today uh, or this year, and it will be also shared by my colleagues in the, uh, in the uh, chat. Uh, and also, um, so he will introduce the results of the study and then we will uh, move forward. I would like to just uh, encourage all of you to raise your questions in the Q&A session that, uh, that I, I can uh, also respond them and them target to our uh, respective members of the European Parliament uh, to facilitate the discussion. So, Patrick, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, I would like to welcome everyone to uh, in this uh, event. And I'm going to try to be relatively brief. So what political capital was trying to achieve is to somehow measure how open members of the European Parliament are to cooperating with authoritarian regimes or uh, backing authoritarian interests. So we basically collected over 90 voting results uh, of the European Parliament uh, and put those votes into five categories, uh, Chinese People's Party critical, Kremlin critical, authoritarian project, information sovereignty, and common EU foreign policy. And we created corresponding indexes for these. Now, uh, the vote results were quantified by weighing uh, voting actions based on whether they were uh, supportive of authoritarian interests or critical of them. And then scores were calculated for all five indexes for individual members of the European Parliament, national delegations, national parties, and EP groups. And in each of these indexes, zero is the most open attitude to supporting authoritarian interests, and 100 is clearly against. Now, I must mention that numbers in themselves are black and white. So um, we needed qualitative analysis to supplement them. And all the materials uh, that we created in this project uh, are available on our project website, which will be linked in the chat. And uh, we also created individual profiles for MEPs from the V4, uh, Austria, Bulgaria, and Romania for readers to get more information on their views on geopolitics. Now, moving on, um, we, we use a cluster analysis to separate five groups of MEPs or five different approaches to EU foreign policy based on their individual index scores on all five indexes. And if we if you see the, the largest group that is of uh, what we call integrationist hoax, they support taking critical stances against basically all authoritarian regimes 
uh, and they also support overarching EU strategies on disinformation and foreign policy. Now, establishment critical hoax, uh, who are predominantly from the ECR, the Greens, they have NO 2011 and FIDES in their ranks as well, are somewhat critical of proposed action on disinformation on EU foreign policy strategy, not because they are friendly to authoritarian regimes, but because they have concerns with the specific policies proposed by the EP majority. Uh, sovereignist balancers, who basically, for instance, Lega or Fratelli d'Italia or the Spanish Vox, they support action against China and other authoritarian regimes individually, but they are much more lenient on Russia and they are completely against common EU action on disinformation or a common foreign EU, EU foreign policy. Uh, the other two groups, they are the least likely to even support uh, individual resolutions on China, uh, especially Russia or other authoritarian regimes, while the group that we call Eurosceptic dictator huggers, they're basically against the EU taking any sort of action against any of these regimes. Introducing the China critical index uh, that we have, you can see that all five mainstream political groups in the European Parliament are highly critical of China. And you can count some of the populist forces, for instance, Lega in their ranks as well. Basically, the very open supporters of the regime in China sit in the left group, the far left of the European Parliament. Uh, and in plenaries, they even you know, connect the EP's proposals uh, on China to the so-called US propaganda. Um, while there are other forces in the European Parliament who rhetorically in plenaries criticize China, but when it comes to voting, they, for instance, abstain. And we believe that one of the likely reasons for this is that just like Russia, they see China as some sort of balance to the EU-led Western order that they reject. For instance, we can talk about the German AFD in this case. Um, and since China's soft power efforts seem to be very limited in their results and only you know, really touch on the far left, uh, China likely turns to malign influence in Europe on the national and individual levels, uh, and especially using its economic power, trying to exploit this economic power. And uh, one example of this is, for instance, in Hungary, the ruling government is seeking joint projects with Beijing, such as the Budapest Belgrade railway renovation. Um, and we know that some oligarchs connected to the ruling party are going to benefit from this. Um, and the result that we see here is, for instance, Fidesz voted against freezing uh, the ratification process of the EU-China investment deal. And one other thing that we must emphasize is that there are individual relationships with China that also constitute a risk. For instance, there is a Chinese MEP who is known for very close connections to some Chinese officials. And his uh, China critical score, for instance, is way lower than the other three members of his party sitting in the European Parliament. Now, moving to the Kremlin, uh, what we can see is that it has more widespread appeal because it is backed by both the far left and the far right in the European Parliament. Um, and while ideologically it is closer to the far right, Russia, we believe, has been extremely successful in portraying itself as a superpower militarily, economically, and politically. So it can be enticing to both sides of the, of the political extremes as once again, a counterbalance to the EU and US-led Western order. And this sort of successful portrayal is also successful in convincing some mainstream political forces uh, to advocate for resetting relations with Russia. And we can also mention that Russia can use its financial and personal connections to influence European decision-making. There are uh, mainstream political forces who are rhetorically highly critical of the Kremlin but for instance, would reject voting for paragraphs calling for halting Nord Stream 2. Um, and overall, Europe-wide, uh, we can say that Russia has failed to stop EU sanctions against the country, but its allies in Europe can limit further EU action, for instance, by advocating for you know, 
uh, the alleged damages caused by sanctions on Russia. Uh, and thus, you know, European officials, we believe, would not propose actions that are certain to be vetoed in the Council. Uh, and in the CEE region, the Hungarian ruling party is one of the forces that is actively promoting this narrative. And thus, it is one of the main actors that is partaking in this sort of limitation of EU policy. Um, and nevertheless, altogether, we can say that the CEE region is tougher on Russia than the EU on average, particularly because the very Russia critical stances of the Romanian and Polish delegations. But you know, there are still vulnerabilities uh, in Eastern Europe, like, for instance, the Bulgarian Socialist Party, which is one of the most uh, Kremlin friendly mainstream forces in the European Parliament right now, uh, which is an example of Russia using, you know, old communist era connections potentially to try to influence European decision making. Uh, as for the our common EU foreign policy index, uh, we can see that support for reports that advocate for moving to qualified majority voting in foreign affairs is relatively slim, even in the European Parliament. And in this regard, uh, the ECR is clearly against this uh, because they claim that the lobbying power of smaller states would be lost uh, in this situation. Uh, while I must also, men also mention the Greens who uh, generally when it comes to these sort of strategic issues, they are still more likely to, to vote for uh, what the uh, EP proposed, but they have often expressed concerns about their priorities not being taken into account by the uh, EP majority. Uh, for instance, uh, they asked for the removal of a particular paragraph committing the EU to the EU Mercosur trade bill, if I remember correctly. And now uh, moving on to the uh, CE region, we must say that both FIDES and the PIS, the polling rule is ruling party are strongly against moving to QMV voting. Now, Fidesz is doing it for practical reasons because it has vetoed EU initiatives regularly in the Council, using it as some sort of a favor towards its authoritarian partners. While the PIS's refusal is more ideological in nature, partly because they oppose EU integration, further EU integration in general, and partly according to what Roland Freudenstein told us, partly because it's an initiative that's seen as being mainly pushed by Germany and one part of PIS's identity is anti-Germanism. Uh, moving on to what the EU can do, we believe that one of, the, one of the first things is remedying the sort of crippling effect of the unanimity voting requirement, for instance, by really emphasizing this topic in the conference on the future of the European Union, because if it becomes a concrete takeaway of the conference, then it would become harder for member states to oppose it completely. Um, states could, member states could also use constructive abstention more often, which would allow them to uh, declare that they are not going to apply a particular decision, but they would accept that it is binding on the European Union as a whole. And the third idea is to form you know, coalitions of the willing within the European Union, to coordinate foreign policy and try to include reluctant member states over time. Uh, the second issue is transparency. We believe that lobbying rules must be enforced on both the EU and national levels uh, very strictly to try to cut off financial channels of corrupt foreign influence. We believe that the EU market must be protected from hostile foreign state investments. Uh, and we also believe that revolving door type of corruption, which is basically former top politicians taking posts in state companies in, for instance, Russia, uh, there should be clear rules against this. And the last thing we wanted to mention is that we believe the US should do more to push back against authoritarian influence in the EU and build alliances against China. And in this regard, cooperation between the Congress and the European Parliament could be a very crucial motive. And now I am going to give the word back to uh, Peter Krakow to introduce the upcoming section of our discussion. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Patrick, for, for summarizing the study. Uh, uh, Patrick, our analyst at Political Capital Institute was leading the project. Uh, and uh, also I have to mention uh, right now, you can just see 
my, my colleague Chaba Moanar, who I just wanted to mention, he was the methodological guru uh, behind all the figures that you can read in the study that he just shared with you in the, in the chat. Um, so, and also I have to mention, I should have mentioned them at the, at the introduction that, that this is not only a project of Political Capital Institute and National Endowment for Democracy, because we also had uh, very good national partners for, with whom uh, we could uh, cooperate uh, from Austria, Fabian Schmidt, journalist uh, from Bulgaria, the Center for the Study of Democracy. And as, as I could see, they are even among the attendees. So welcome the Czech, uh, from uh, the Czech Republic, the Prague Security S Studies uh, Institute. Um, from Poland, journalist uh, Michal Kaczewicz. And from Slovakia, uh, Institute for Public Affairs. And last but not least, Global Focus from Romania. So some of us are, uh, some of them are here with us. Uh, thank you. And, uh, I would like right now to uh, pass over the floor to my colleagues who will share you a pre-recorded, short pre-recorded interview that I did with uh, Kevin Shives, uh, who is the co-director of the uh, International Forum um, uh, of the National Endowment for Democracy, which is the research center and the think tank of the National Endowment for Democracy. He will talk a bit about the transatlantic aspects and the need for transatlantic cooperation in the uh, pushback against authoritarian influence. And then will come the uh, round table with our esteemed uh, members of the European Parliament. So uh, Kati Chaba, please share with us the video. Hi everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Kevin Scheibs. Uh, with us, who is uh, Associate Director of the International Forum uh, of Democracy, the Research Division of the National Endowment for uh, Democracy. And we will conduct this short interview for, for the sake of the conference. Uh, the institution uh, where Kevin is working is dealing extensively uh, with the forms of malign uh, foreign interference of Russia and China uh, to Western institutions. And my first question to you, Kevin, would be that uh, you worked as a China expert for the State Department and uh, the Department of Defense as well. You have a lot of experience about how China uh, interferes into the institutions of the Western world. Based on these experiences, what do you think is the biggest threat that China is posing to Europe in particular? Great. Well, thanks for having me uh, today, Peter. And uh, look, Political Capital is a great organization. The National Endowment of Democracy is, is excited to be able to work with you all on, on, on things related to authoritarian influence and, and how democracies respond. Um, I, I think that's a really good question. I think um, China is absolutely the sort of new person on the block in terms of how people think about authoritarian influence. Uh, the idea of what Russia has been doing is a little bit more well known than what China is doing. So I think it's the right question. Um, I, I would cite two things as, as areas the most concern or the biggest threat in terms of China and how it, what it poses to European uh, solidarity and democracy. Um, the first is on information. Um, I'm absolutely convinced that information um, and how information flows is really the backbone of democracy. If you can't agree on the truth, you can't agree to disagree, which is a fundamental precept for democracies and how they operate. China is, is, is conducting massive global investments in the media markets all around the world um, in order to compete better in the information space. And these investments are driven by the state. They're not driven by the private media. They're not driven by innovative journalism the way that we think of them in Europe and in America, but they're driven by state-driven media conglomerates. And these are in areas where really honestly, no market is too small for China to not uh, come in and try to be able to create a narrative about China um, that obviously is one preferred by the party, whether it's ignoring human rights abuses or whether it's talking great about Chinese diplomacy or history and the like. These are the narratives that China wants, and the party really wants to be able um, to have play out in the public domain um, within democracies all around the world. The second area I would add to is how capital works within societies. So I see two things to this. The first is really the leveraging of China's own market 
for political gain. And what I mean here is that the ability of China and its uh, control over its own information environment in China to be able to bully uh, foreign companies into taking um, and to being quiet about different issues where their companies are involved, like what's happened recently in the apparel market in, in China on forced labor and in Xinjiang, to be able to bully them through their own information manipulation and through their own population so that they will stay silent. They'll say nothing about these sort of human rights abuses or other things that are, that are happening all the time in China that's, uh, that's beginning to undermine some of the values-driven business models that Western um, and other uh, democratic companies often have. The second is simply the corro corroding influence of capital in different societies abroad. I'm not really talking here about you know, debt-ridden contracts under Belt and Road Initiative or anything like that, but what I'm talking about here is the ability of private and semi-private and state-driven um, Chinese companies uh, to uh, really manipulate the uh, um, political environment in some of these countries because they have such leverage for financial gain. So they're investing in a lot of um, big industries, making strategic investments in places like the Czech Republic, which is one thing that my institution really, really dived headfirst into looking at, and also investing in the financial and personal relationships of high level political elites in Europe and elsewhere in order to be able to not just gain market access in these countries and compete better, but really be able to distort some of the political decision making that these leaders are involved in in order to um, allow for greater access um, by these companies, allow for uh, more uh, China preferred narratives about what's going on in China and its foreign policy. Um, these are the types of what we've termed corrosive capital trends that we see playing out in a lot of places. And I think Europe is absolutely susceptible to these, as is the United States and a number of other democracies around the world. Thank you. And uh, right now, uh, there are the celebrations uh, of the 100th anniversary of the Chinese uh, Communist uh, Party. And uh, it, it uh, brings some light on the um, infightings and also the, the uh, issues in the uh, leadership of the Chinese uh, Communist uh, Party and the, uh, and the People's Republic of China. How do you see the tendencies uh, uh, regarding the leadership and within the leadership of the CCP and, and the uh, Republic, uh, People's Republic of China? And what do they tell us about the possible future of Chinese coercion and diplomacy? There are some voices uh, optimists who say that uh, we will see a kind of end of the world warrior diplomacy, others rather skeptical about that. What do you think? Yeah, I think uh, even recently there's been some really important developments in this regard. So over the last, you know, three or four years, uh, global public opinion about China has just absolutely plummeted. Um, this is in light of um, human rights abuses that have become so apparent in places like Xinjiang, um, all the awareness raising about uh, China's state subsidized industrial policy and its effect on economies around the world. Obviously, a much tougher position on China has been taken by other governments, United States, you know, some in Europe, Japan, elsewhere. Um, and its, uh, its, its public opinion has really suffered. And just a, a month or two ago, um, and I believe it was in early June, President Xi addressed the Politburo on this issue, on the issue of international communications and how China tells its story, which is something that China has always, um, and the party has always emphasized throughout its history, is telling its story well. And I think the lessons that they drew from the, the recent decline in public opinion, they weren't we should be different in how, we, in how China tells its story, with, which is ripe with disinformation, propaganda, you know, high levels of investments by, by state conglomerates in media markets around the world, sort of wolf warrior diplomacy, but it was, we need to do it better, okay? So it's not just, I don't think this was a change in, in, in fundamental strategy by China in terms of how it conducts international diplomacy, how it conducts international communications, whether through, you know, authentic or inauthentic behavior online. I think this is instead just a small change in tactics at most, um, what, the, what she really emphasized in this speech to the Polar Bureau was two things. One is China's uh, communications core needs to be more professional and more professionalized, more resourced, okay? So that means to be more coordinated among different entities where the party directs much of this communications and its precepts for how 
and what people say about China are respected and they need to be better resourced, okay? So there needs to be more work being done um, on this area, more investments in the propaganda apparatus, more investments by state um, backed media outlets in different markets around the world. You know, there was sort of a, a, a small reference to changing our tone, which is a reference to the Wolf Warrior diplomacy and what a lot of people have begun to, um, that Europe obviously has experienced a lot of. Um, but I think that was not at all the central point of his speech. It's that they need to do things not differently, but simply better. And so I don't think there's going to be a massive change in strategy here um, at this sort of, you know, 100 year mark of the party and some of the recent events about uh, global declining public opinion. But instead, um, I think it's just going to be, you know, a more resourced and more professionalized way um, in which China conducts its international communications. Um. You, you gave an interview to The Diplomat recently where you emphasized the importance of alliances uh, in facing the China challenge. And could you elaborate a bit on what do you see as kind of best practices in facing the China threat in, in light of uh, the importance of alliances that you mentioned? Yeah, sure, it's a huge question, obviously. A, a few things kind of come to light um, or come to mind when I think of the characteristics of, of strong alliance making um, in this area. You know, one is these alliances need to be whole of society. We talk a lot about whole of government strategies and things like that, but these sort of alliances need to go beyond government to government relationships. They can't just happen in the G7 um, or NATO or anything like that. They need to be um, organic across a, a number of layers of society. So civil society organizations need to partner with each other. This means you know, information sharing and content sharing among major media outlets that are democratically sourced um, or uh, business associations across um, the Atlantic Ocean and, and elsewhere uh, partnering together in advance to talk about human rights abuses and provide companies the cover um, within their own existing operations in China. Um, and, and these sort of things need to happen across all layers. It can't just be governments out there doing the work. Uh, two, I think the alliances need to be very nimble. Um, there are a number of competing interests that different governments, that different societies have at times. And these alliances can't just operate where if you get seven G, you know, G7 members to agree on it, great. But if you only get six, forget it. We're not doing anything about it. They have to be nimble. They have to be small, mini lateral coalitions. Um, I know the United States is pursuing some with, with the, with Asia, with the Quad, with India, Japan, Australia, US. There's a lot of different arrangements within uh, Europe that are happening as well. There are other arrangements that need to be uh, explored um, all throughout the world. And it's really um, the third point too, is that I think you need to look beyond sort of the advanced or long running democracies of the world um, and how they're dealing with China's influence. Taiwan is a great example here. They have done probably one of the best jobs recently um, after their um, elections over the last year or two in countering authoritarian interference and disinformation within Taiwan. They had a great partnership between civil society and government. Um, they were very innovative. They were absolutely at, um, at, at, at the tip of the spear in terms of how China is, is doing this influence and sharp power activities abroad. And they had really strong success. But because they're oftentimes isolated international conversations, they're smaller um, and so forth. They're often um, you know, not really consulted when it comes to how governments and civil society should address this challenge. They need to be brought into the fold here. There's a lot of different countries with great experiences to share and needs to go well beyond sort of the longer established democracies like Europe, United States, et cetera. Um, and then at last, I would say that these sort of um, responses to China's coercion and pressure um, needs to be automatic. Um, it needs to be regularized. Um, it needs to be expected of governments and civil society that they speak out quickly in, in, when these instances arise, whether it's talking about forced labor in China um, or talking about some a new surveillance system that's being deployed in Tibet um, or talking about the corrosive um, capital influence that it, sometimes China's investments have abroad. These are the things that need to be regularized. They need to be automatic. That needs to be the new norm that's developed, that democracies speak up loudly, they speak up together, um, instead of sort of dealing with these things in a crisis mode or on a case-by-case -case basis where, you know, uh, democratic governments and civil society organizations or businesses will sometimes shirk away from the opportunities to really take a values um, approach stand um, and really compete in that uh, market of ideas with, with authoritarian models like China. Thank you very much, Kevin.
So right now, after uh, Kevin Shive's thoughts, I, I just have to say that the reason why we had to pre-record that because uh, Kevin is in the United States and it, we did not want him to get up at the middle of the night uh, to give his input. So that was the reason why it was pre-recorded. And right now I would, I would uh, turn to uh, my, our esteemed MEP guests and let, let me introduce them once again and then start the discussion. So uh, we have with us Reinhard Butikofer uh, from the uh, Grünen uh, group uh, and also from the Greens in the uh, European uh, Parliament and uh, who is uh, also the chair of uh, the delegation for relations with the uh, People's Republic of China. Uh, we also have with us uh, Katalin Che from Hungary, uh, from Momentum and, and Renew Europe from the European Parliament, who is a member of Subcommittee on Human Rights. And uh, also we have uh, Radem Kanev uh, from Bulgaria, uh, from the Democrats for Strong Bulgaria, uh, which is a mem who is a member of the European People's Party. So we have a, a group of MEPs uh, belonging to different uh, uh, political families, but at the same time, I think uh, they share uh, quite a lot of uh, concerns about the uh, issues of authoritarian influence, but uh, let them tell their thoughts. So my first question would be a general one. And, and I would uh, turn to you, Mr. Butikofer, uh, first, which authoritarian regimes uh, you think among the third countries that they pose the biggest threat to the European Union, uh, the integrity of the European Union and its member states? And why? Reinhard, you're silenced. You're muted. Thank you for including me in the conversation. Um, I would say that the biggest challenge uh, to us in, in Europe is certainly being posed by China. That is reflected in our analysis that China presents us with a systemic rivalry. And that does not just pertain to their domestic uh, system of governance, which they are increasingly also exporting, but also um, to the uh, uh, system of global governance that they are trying to create, which um, as far as I can understand, follows the idea of creating a, a China-centric, global order, you could call it a hub and spokes um, order, uh, with China moving to the center uh, of uh, global power. And uh, the combination of this hegemonic ambition with the um, authoritarian and in many parts even totalitarian nature of the regime clearly um, endanger uh, the, the very values on which our order um, has been uh, built, namely human rights, the rule of law, and democracy. And under this challenge, I think it makes absolutely no sense to pretend that there is somehow a, a there could be a, or there would be a trade-off between economic interests and uh, human rights. Um, this kind of uh, phrasing of the, the question, first of all, ignores completely the national security dimension of the challenge, which I think, frankly, we just can't do. Uh, but it also um, underestimates how much short-term special interests are taken hostage to the disadvantage of European economy. So uh, maybe we should talk about whose economic interest. And 
it's interesting to observe that in the German business community, for instance, there is a, um, uh, a relevant divide between different points of view. Some of the um, multinational corporations that play a very strong role in China uh, clearly advocate a different position than business organization like the German Federation of Industry or the Association of the Engineering Industry that are representing small and medium-sized enterprises and um, are much more critical. And interestingly, the president of the German Federation of Industry, Mr. Huswurm, just recently reminded German investors in China that they have an obligation uh, to take account of human rights issues. So I believe that the old uh, perception that somehow human rights and economic interests are weighing on different parts of the scale is not uh, an apt description of where we are now. And if we include national security as an important dimension against the Chinese challenge, then I believe that uh, a policy oriented along the values that I just mentioned is our best bet. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like now uh, turn to uh, Mr. Kanav to share his thoughts on the same question. So uh, which regime or regimes you think pose the biggest threat for the European Union and its member states and, and why? Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I will uh, talk uh, very briefly because, uh, first of all, uh, I would support uh, more or less everything I have already said. Of course, uh, from Bulgarian perspective, uh, we are generally used to uh, understand Russia as uh, the main uh, authoritarian threat and influence uh, because of uh, specific historical reasons and the very high level of sympathy towards Russia uh, in the Bulgarian population, which makes, uh, as you already uh, mentioned, for example, one of our main parties, the Bulgarian Socialist Party, or bearing in mind the latest uh, election results, our, one of our ex-main parties, because uh, the Socialists does not seem to be a main party anymore, but one of the, the middle-sized parties. Uh, they have always been under strong Russian influence. Uh, we have a set of minor, usually nationalist parties, uh, which uh, are uh, directly financed by Russia and are normally uh, using uh, uh, plain Kremlin propaganda in their political discourse. Uh, we have a very, very strong uh, influence of Russia over the energy system of the country and uh, ownership or dependence uh, on, uh, on materials, fossil fuels, uh, etc. However, even in Bulgaria, uh, now we look with great concern on the Chinese influence in the Western Balkans. Uh, where, of course, a lot of our strategic interests and national security uh, reasons uh, are. Uh, so uh, for the European Union as a whole, I will fully share uh, Reinhardt's, uh, uh, Reinhardt's view. And uh, especially for Bulgaria and Southeastern Europe, of course, we have a, a focus on the Russian influence. But yet, in our countries too, the Chinese influence becomes uh, bigger and of uh, greater concern each, uh, each next day. Of course, uh, the, uh, one of the reasons, very, very obvious, is that Russia simply doesn't have the economic power, uh, the strength uh, uh, to, to provide, uh, uh, let's say, uh, soft influence. Uh, on, uh, on the countries like uh, the Chinese uh, are uh, obviously showing in the western parts of the Balkan Peninsula. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kanev. And, and last but not least in this round, I would like to turn to uh, Katalin Cha. Uh, Ms. Cha, please share your thoughts as well. 
Who do you think is the main threat or which regime you think is the main threat for the European Union and, and why you think so? Uh, thank you very much. And uh, first of all, let me thank uh, you for having me at this at this event. And uh, I let me start by saying that I, I mostly agree with the analysis of the colleagues uh, of Mr. Kanev and Mr. Butikoffer. Uh, I also do believe that uh, China, but also Russia as a close second are the two um, most dangerous rivals uh, of the European Union, so to say. Um, and uh, I would just like to share some other thoughts maybe, which could complement the analysis of, of, of the colleagues. And I would uh, mostly talk about public perception. And uh, as the lack of, uh, of, of, uh, of a systemic awareness to the, to the threat uh, as, as the main focus. I, I, I believe that uh, in the case of Russia, uh, there is of course quite a big division uh, regarding how, how people consider Russia as a partner or rival. But in, in, in recent years, uh, mm, I believe that a lot of, of, of uh, European citizens, especially in Eastern Europe, not, but not only at this part of the world, uh, regard Russia with a certain level of uh, cultural and historical kinship. Uh, this can partly be the legacy, of course, of the Soviet Union, of communist regimes, of uh, a decades-long coexistence at uh, my part of Europe, but uh, also due to the very successful lobbying uh, of the uh, populist regimes, uh, who, which, which try to undermine the EU's image in the region. Uh, so, so therefore, people, while remaining supportive of the EU, are not necessarily against Russian influence anymore. Uh, it's, of course, it's not to say that they are suddenly pro-Russia, but they do not have to be either. Um, I believe that Moscow's goal uh, is greatly to make people question the status quo that is now dominated by the notion uh, that the ultimate success a country can achieve is to be a productive and loyal member of the EU and NATO. And, uh, Russia is becoming pretty successful at making more and more people doubt their country's uh, geopolitical allegiance. So in other words, I believe that Russia does not need for Russian people to further its interests, uh, but rather uh, only to increase uh, the number of questions uh, people have in their minds regarding the importance uh, of Western alliances. Uh, when it comes to China, it's, uh, it's, it's a bit different uh, of a case. Uh, as I said, in regards to Russia, people are quite divided, uh, of, uh, but uh, the historical impacts uh, people might or might not feel towards Russia are, I believe, quite generally missing when it comes to, to how people regard China. Europeans in general do not really have similar historical experiences related to China. A lot of uh, citizens do not even have any preconceptions regarding this country, which uh, makes it all the more easier for Beijing to expand its influence in Europe. And considering that the Chinese resources are virtually unlimited in terms of money, human power, or technology, in the sense China is even much more dangerous than Russia today, especially as uh, Russia's economic clout has, has been built significantly over the past years. And I, I think we have a moral ob obligation on the side of the EU to tell the story. Uh, we have a moral obligation to stand up against the human rights violations uh, uh, China uh, commits in regions as like Xinjiang, Tibet, or Hong Kong. People have to know that this is the other part of the story, not only the uh, favorable uh, cultural or, uh, or economic impact, uh, China might influence, uh, might exert in their country, but, but there is this other side of the story. Uh, we have to be aware uh, of the situation of the persecuted minorities and we have to stand up for it as, as the union. We, and we also need to send a very clear message to the Chinese government that uh, we Europeans will not tolerate ethnic cleansing, whatever it happens in the world, uh, but we also need to have our population as, uh, behind us when, when we formulate this messaging. Uh, and, and I also do believe that we have to be more explicit when it comes to the sanctioning mechanisms. Uh, 
but I suppose we, we might talk about it later down this conversation. Yes, thank you for that, because it, it, it would be a later question of mine uh, on, on the sanctions regime, but it seems to me that there is some kind of uh, consensus with, with different emphases uh, on that uh, there is, a, I mean, China poses a, an increasing threat uh, to the uh, European Union, but there was also a question already be received too, and one of them is, is uh, a, a question from Geoffrey Harris uh, that, that uh, Mr. Butikofer would have a good answer to. I just raised the question and then give the floor to to Mr. Butikofer. So uh, Geoffrey's question is, uh, historically the PRC has broadly encouraged European integration. Russia is like the USSR, basically hostile to the basic idea. In responding to interference and disinformation, does this mean you should take a differentiated approach? So two questions in one. First of all, how much PRCs uh, and, and, and the Kremlin's uh, attitude towards European integration is different first. Second, how much uh, should we handle them separately? Mr. Butikofer, what is yours? Well, thanks to Geoffrey for, for the question. I would say, however, Geoffrey, that um, from where I sit, um, the phase when China um, would regularly uh, utter support of European integration that that has already become ancient history. Um, in, in recent times, uh, we saw efforts uh, on the Chinese part to subdivide Europe as best they could. They, they created the, the 16 plus one, then 17 plus one, now again, 16 plus one format they tried to, uh, a similar trick with the Nordic countries. They tried a similar trick with the Mediterranean uh, countries uh, from the European Union. Um, uh, I still remember um, a, a high-ranking Chinese um, academic telling me at some point, if I want to have problems, I go to Brussels, to the European institutions. If I want to solve problems, I go uh, to the national capitals. And if you just look at recent events, um, the Chinese have invited uh, foreign ministers from Ireland, Hungary, Poland, and uh, Serbia uh, to, um, uh, to um, impress on them their ambition to finally uh, um, get CAI ratified. They're now inviting uh, other um, foreign ministers from Malta, Spain, Italy, and Portugal. And uh, Xi Jinping himself did a, a video conference with uh, President Macron and Chancellor Merkel. So they're really dealing with the national capitals in order to divide and conquer. They're not fond of the idea of a European Union. This present Chinese leadership understands that the European institutions are their most formidable opponent around Europe. Sorry, I had some difficulties finding the right button. Uh, thank you, thank you, Reinhard. We will have a, another question. We have another question from Kestra. I would save it for uh, uh, later. And uh, right now, I I would uh, raise a different question and 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 turn to uh, Mr. Radev. Um, so um, the I I I don't want to. Uh, I, I have to. Uh, I mean leave it the opportunity to raise some questions also that are related to your respective home countries about Chinese influence. And, and Mr. Kanev, how, how do you see, I mean, um, everyone is, is very curious if a new stable Bulgarian government can be formed 
and what would you your expectations about the next Bulgarian government, its stability, and also what do you think we can expect in terms of its China policy? Uh, thank you. Thank you for that question, uh, on which I certainly don't have the answer, and I think uh, no one no one has it. Uh, the situation in uh, Bulgaria three days after the second uh, ele elections in a row, because we had elections in April, the parliament uh, didn't manage to form a majority in the government, and now we had uh, elections on Sunday. Uh, we have uh, different results, but more or less the same stalemate. Uh, we have a new first political force in the country. It's a, a brand new party, which could be easily compared to Beppe Grillo's movement in Italy, formed uh, by and around the most prominent showman uh, for the last two or even uh, two and a half decades. Uh, it's uh, a party without clear political profile and now uh, they have offered uh, a government uh, through Facebook. Uh, they have not yet received the mandate to, to form a government, but they have made a public offer through the personal Facebook channel of Mr. Trifonov, the, the party leader, who is, by the way, not a member of the parliament. He didn't want to, to be one. Uh, the, they have only a quarter of the seats in, in parliament, so offering uh, a full government team to the other parties is a rather bizarre move, but uh, uh, it's their style of, uh, of doing politics, obviously. Uh, I cannot foresee whether this government will receive enough support in parliament. However, if I, if I am to, to make a small bet, I would bet on no. And maybe even I would bet that this will not be the official proposal when they receive the mandate. Uh, in any case, we will not have a stable parliament and a stable majority in this term. Hopefully we will have some, some government uh, uh, at all because we need uh, at least a period with the government. Uh, having in mind our recovery and resilience plan is not yet presented in Brussels and I would uh, even say not yet fully ready. And we have a number of, uh, of other issues. Uh, one of them being that we are uh, about 10 years behind uh, even Central Europe uh, in climate policies and uh, decarbonization policies. Uh, we are in a severe institutional and rule of law crisis for more than 10 years now. So we, we need both a majority and the government. Uh, anyway, I, I don't see a stable government, but the second part of your question is very interesting uh, because till now, for many years, uh, Chinese influence was not a problem in Bulgarian politics. Uh, Russian influence certainly was. Uh, we had uh, a major, even dominant political party and member of EPP. Uh, this is uh, uh, some... Uh, uh, some detail which is uh, important uh, nowadays that my party uh, was not allied to our EPP sister party. We were almost always opposition to their government. And uh, now uh, from this position of, uh, of opposition party, we made a huge rise in our influence because uh, exactly opposition to, to this party was what our voters wanted from us. Uh, but they were uh, always pretending to be very pro-Western, pro-European, uh, always having good relations with Russian factors. Uh, and they were never posing significant threats point of view of Chinese influence. Uh, they were never an uh, urban and Fidesz type of government vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. Uh, now in this presented expert type of government, non-party type of government from this new political party, we see uh, prominent figures uh, from the beginning of the 21st century uh, in Bulgaria, people related to big business and people who are at least acceptable uh, 
towards uh, this new model of, uh, of China influence? So uh, both questions are largely open. That's what I can say. Yes, thank you. Uh, and uh, I would have a similar question to Ms. Ms. Cha. Uh, Katalin, th there is also a question by an anonymous attendee in the, in the um, Q&A room that is, is um, quite a lot uh, connected to your, your background. So uh, the question is, Hungary did not block the Xinjiang related sanctions, but afterwards they publicly criticized them. Is this because Hungary's ruling coalition approaches EU sanctions both differently than statements? And I would have a related question that would be in more general about how much you think that uh, Hungarian domestic politics can be more shaped by this China issue in the future and how much you think it is a potential for the opposition that you are part of uh, approaching the elections in 2022, April. Thank you. I will start with the second part uh, and then answer the specific question later in a moment where, surprisingly for me as well, but a foreign policy related issue very much dominates the the, the public discourse here in Hungary, uh, which uh, was very often not the case. Uh, this concerns a, a large scale construction project uh, of uh, a campus uh, of the Fuda University in Budapest, which is basically a gigantic project worth uh, almost uh, 2 billion euros, almost entirely financed by Chinese loans, the materials and the construction would also be Chinese. Uh, and uh, on top of that, this construction would take place at uh, a plot, uh, an area of land where uh, originally a student campus would have been built for, for Hungarian students, uh, which uh, will not um, uh, happen eventually due to the uh, construction of the Fudan, Fudan University site. So this part, uh, huge protests here in Hungary, uh, a very elevated and heated public tension. And basically through this issue, uh, um, a lot of average citizens who do not necessarily follow uh, foreign politics got a very firsthand uh, taste of what it means really in practice when uh, a government is uh, leaning more towards uh, authoritarian allies and making uh, compromises with the uh, rival countries, uh, a trend that we in the opposition have been uh, speaking up against for, for many, many years. So now this is really a central issue because it's, uh, it's very obvious for everybody that uh, if the co country continues its uh, present trajectory, uh, it will mean uh, more and more uh, lenient towards uh, projects of uh, so to say, questionable importance for, uh, for, for Hungary, but undertaken from uh, uh, financing from, from uh, authoritarian partners, financing that is very often uh, and not available for uh, the, like for public information for many years uh, and, and happening in counter to, to Hungary's own interests. Uh, either business interests or interests of Hungarian students or, or what have you. So, so right now, this is a central topic of, uh, of the election campaign. And uh, basically, I believe that the choice here is quite obvious. If Mr. Orban and his Fidesz government stays in power, then uh, the country will continue uh, down the current path where basically the government is working against uh, a strong EU rather uh, trying to uh, build the uh, divisions within the community, trying to weaken down, water down the EU to a purely economic uh, trading community, getting rid of the values, uh, which should be central uh, in, in Europe, I believe, and rather making more and more uh, mm, room for uh, maneuver uh, for uh, hostile powers, uh, 
uh, within the community also acting as Trojan horses uh, as, as, as some of the, these powers during negotiations. And whereas we in the opposition, we believe that uh, Hungary's path should uh, lead to the heart of the European Union, and we advocate for a stronger uh, European community. Uh, and the food issue is, I believe, is really the peak of uh, of this narrative. Uh, and uh, I, I was also surprised that this, as, as this is not the first uh, similar project uh, in in that regard, we had the construction of the Budapest Belgrade railway station, for instance, or also the construction of the Pax nuclear power plant both undertaken uh, from financing from uh, either China or Russia had really classified uh, for, for, for decades really. But this, this one is really something that uh, really broke through the public awareness. Uh, regarding the question of, uh, of sanctions, well, uh, it's, it's, it's quite unfortunate really that uh, in, in general, uh, and this one is, is an example, but, uh, the Hungarian government has been abusing its veto power, uh, trying to prevent uh, any sort of strong and united response uh, when it comes to sanctioning human rights abuses in uh, in countries which uh, are now closer to the heart of Mr. Orban than the Union. Um, I, I, I think it's really shameful that uh, in, in, in this case, uh, Mr. Siarto made a public uh, statement saying that this uh, European sanction uh, procedure is, uh, I don't know what was the perfect wording, but, but it was something like on lineup, this is just useless exhibit exhibitionism. And this is, I think, the real conclusion on how he regards the union's foreign policy objectives. I believe that this is something that is very detrimental to the stability and strength of the union. This is just yet again an example of uh, why the unanimity uh, principle in uh, foreign uh, affairs related uh, issues, particularly uh, human rights related issues, uh, is, is uh, not something that can be tenable on the long run. Yes, thank you. And, and this is exactly a recommendation that we, we set ourselves as well in our study last year and this, this year as well. And even if it seems like Hungary in the uh, sanctions related uh, votes in the European Council is usually still following the mainstream line and did not have not really dared uh, to, to block the decisions on its own, but in other less uh, important, less relevant, less conclusive uh, questions, the appetite for this vetoism he has, and obstructionism has clearly been on the rise. Uh, Mr. Butikofer, I would, I would um, turn to you now and, and again, I, do not, I cannot resist the temptation to, talk, to ask a bit about foreign policy and domestic policy related question at the same time. So uh, the election, Bundestag elections will be in uh, September 2021 this year. And uh, it seems like according to the polls that Greens will for almost sure be at the governing coalition. They might be even the senior uh, governmental party in, in the next German government, which will shape uh, the I mean, future of not only Germany, but the whole European Union. So what do you think that the world and Europe should expect from a German, uh, from a green led government when it comes especially to China policy? And for example, do you think that, that connecting it to Ms. Czech's remarks, do you think that, that any, uh, any kind of, let's say, reform of the European institution, for example, to change the qualified majority voting uh, would be, possible and does the Greens have some ambition like that? Thank you for the question and let me warn you first of all that um, polling is very transitory and um, it's um, never good to call it a day before night strikes. Um, so let's see what happens. I'm, um, I think there are different options but what is um, clearly um, um, visible when you look to the different electoral platforms 
of the main democratic parties, CDU, uh, CSU, SPD, uh, liberals and greens. They all advocate for the abolition of uh, uh, the, uh, the um, unanimity principle on foreign policy. They all advocate uh, qualified majority voting. Uh, but I must say, I'm 100% convinced it will not happen, not in the foreseeable future. I'm willing to wager a sizable bet on that. Uh, and I think it's uh, just focusing on the qualified majority voting uh, is um, running into a dead end uh, because this is a tool that small member countries use to get their issues on the agenda. You may like it or you may not like it. And I, I didn't like what Cyprus did when they blackmailed all the others over their Turkish concerns and prevented sanctions against Belarus to be enacted for many, many weeks. But this is a tool without which they would probably feel nobody is going to listen to them at all if, if the veto would be abolished. So they use that um, in order to take others hostage and not be railroaded. And I guarantee you this is not just uh, the Cypriots. It, it will be Malta. It will be a lot of other small countries. So we have to move beyond uh, this um, um, uh, too narrowly focused uh, conversation. And by the way, a lot of damage has been done uh, to the union, not through uh, veto from small countries, but uh, through uh, selfishness from big countries. Uh, I, I already mentioned um, that um, Macron and Merkel uh, did their video um, uh, uh, meeting with Xi. Uh, I should add that Macron and Merkel surprised everybody else by proposing a Putin summit uh, that would have ratified Putin's position that he's not going to talk to the European Union as such anymore. And uh, it would have signaled nation states, member state capitals now take over the Russia relations. That would have weakened the European Union. That's not a QMB issue. And by the way, there are uh, tools available in the Lisbon Treaty um, to create coalitions of the willing to have enhanced cooperation. So I think in, uh, if we want to move forward in reality and not just talk about stuff, uh, that's where we, we would have to look. Uh, beyond that, um, uh, I, a, a careful analysis of the electoral platform of the four parties I mentioned would lead to the conclusion that all of them are more critical of China in their platforms than the present governing uh, grand coalition is in practice. Um, even CDU is uh, using the words systemic rival for uh, China, uh, words that uh, Mrs. Merkel has avoided using ever since the term has been invented. Um, and uh, uh, liberals and Greens and socialists are all mentioning the issue, issues around China's uh, coercive policies towards Taiwan. So I, I would expect that uh, whoever would build the next German government would probably lead a more pro-European uh, and a more China critical government than the one that we have at the moment. Thank you very much. And because of the fact that you have to uh, leave a bit earlier than the rest of the speakers, I would was a, a last and, and very, uh, I mean, short question to you. Uh, you had been, uh, yeah, you were on the first, you were practically the first on the sanctions list, counter sanctions list of 
of Beijing that, that was introduced after the, the sanctions against uh, uh, China uh, because of the Xinjiang uh, issue. And uh, at the same time, I mean, because of your diplomatic role in the European Parliament, you, has, you have to uh, keep lines of communication with Chinese officials. And you also mentioned your discussion with Chinese scholars. So my short question would be how much your, uh, your connection and access the Chinese officials has changed since the, the sanctions have been implemented. And uh, how do you see the possibility of, of a China-EU dialogue uh, under such, I mean, uh, under such tense diplomatic circumstances? Well, my relations to Chinese officials have strongly deteriorated ever since I helped um, Make it, making it possible that the uh, 2019 Sakharov Prize of the European Parliament was awarded to the Uyghur scholar Ilham Tohti. Uh, that was a, a, a turning point, I, I would assume. And um, most recently, um, the uh, willingness of the Chinese mission to the EU to um, be in touch has been um, extremely limited, but um, I, would, I would argue that Chinese authorities um, are shooting themselves in the foot. They might have hoped that they would isolate the, the nasty people that, that uh, they uh, try to target, but what, what they are confronted with is a, a strong uh, demonstration of solidarity, even colleagues who were less critical of CAI than I have been, um, uh, have agreed to, to uh, put that uh, into the freezer for the time being, as long as the sanctions are still in place. We have um, very good cooperation across party lines. For instance, we have uh, an informal Hong Kong watch group in the European Parliament with representatives from ECR, EPP, Socialists, Liberals and Greens. Uh, we have members in the Interparliamentary Alliance on China, a global outfit uh, with uh, participation from 20 parliaments. And again, uh, the five groups that I mentioned are all represented in that a uh, group of, uh, of uh, parliamentarians from the uh, European Parliament. So I would say what China has achieved is basically encouraging and strengthening our resolve to push back. Thank you very much. And, and Mr. Britikofer has to leave us in five minutes. So I, I would like to thank to you now that you, you could uh, participate in the discussion and share your thoughts. And I would continue uh, with Mr. Khan and, and, and Ms. Ms. Cha. Um, and we, we have a, a question from, um, from the audience again. Um, and um, I would target it to you, Mr. Khanad. Um, what is the more, more ur most urgent issue that needs to be addressed? How can this be translated into policy proposals? So I would narrow it down a bit. Uh, what do you think that the uh, most urgent issue in terms of authoritarian influence or Chinese influence? And if you have to, let's say, if you were the uh, head of the commission or either the head of the European Council, you could create an, an let's say, uh, uh, a total, I, I mean, a majority or even a, um, an anonymous uh, majority behind a decision. So what would be your, your one policy proposal that you think you could, it could help to push back authoritarian and Chinese influence? Dr. Kanab, are you with us? No, unfortunately, we, we have last Mr. Khanab, so hopefully he can join back uh, soon. But then this question would go to you, Ms. Chess. So what, what do you think uh, the, uh, I mean, uh, reflecting a bit to what Mr. Brutikofer has said, uh, we could hear that he is not that big fan of, of the changing the anonymous vote to qualified majority voting. So what would be uh, your, 
reaction to that? And do you have any other suggestions? Excuse me, Peter, for interfering. I'm not, I didn't say I'm not a big fan. I just think it makes no sense in politics to uh, prioritize goals that you cannot realistically achieve. Okay, so it's unrealistic. It's unrealistic. Okay, so, okay. I mean, whichever of you would like to pick up the questions. So, Ms. Chef, Mr. Kanav, the, the question here is what would be your, your most important policy proposal when it comes to EU relationship to China? Okay, I will try that. I saw the, the question in the chat. I think Catalin might also have her answer. Uh, in, in this case, uh, I, I would say, first of all, we have to bear in mind uh, when we have a formidable opponent, such as the Chinese Communist Party, or uh, let it put otherwise, the, the quite strong uh, dynasty of the Red Emperors of China, because I think uh, what we face uh, is a good old uh, Chinese uh, empire tradition with, with a new dynasty claiming to be communist, which doesn't have any significant uh, sense nowadays. Uh, so we uh, cannot expect to have any magic pill or any uh, fast remedy uh, in, in these situations. Uh, and uh, the question, what is most urgent? I would say most urgent uh, is to start thinking strategically as Europe, as European Union, uh, in a unified way, and to start thinking long-term uh, and not uh, short-term narrow business interest. Uh, this is urgent. And next thing, which is completely linked to what I've already said, if something is really urgent and uh, uh, something can bear uh, fast results, uh, it is uh, improving the transatlantic economic ties as fast as possible. Because it is the, uh, it is, uh, the bond, the union between the free countries and free market economies that is and will be much stronger than Chinese influence for many decades to come. And on the other hand, uh, divided within Europe, we obviously fail, but divided through the Atlantic, our task is also very, very difficult. Thank you very much. And, uh, and for Ms. Che, I, I, would, I, would, uh, uh, I would have a different question or more specific one. Uh, you are the only member of the European Parliament from the Hungarian MEPs who was also put on the sanctions list due to your membership to the Human Rights Subcommittee. And uh, in general, uh, I would like to ask you how, how successful, this is something that you, you mentioned beforehand as well, how successful you think that the EU sanctions policy is towards China? Or uh, is it, I mean, is it too soft, too hard, or just right? And if you think it's insufficient, what, what do you think could be done uh, further? Well, I am quite sad to say that uh, the EU's response to the Chinese aggression and human rights violations have not only been too soft, uh, but also I believe that uh, very often they come way too late. I am of course a firm believer in constructive dialogue and diplomatic efforts, but uh, also we have to consider sanctioning mechanisms a legitimate tool when other avenues do not yield the necessary results. As we are the largest trading partner of China, uh, we in the EU really have considerable economic leverage that we can and also we should use to further our foreign policy interests and also our uh, quest for, for, for human rights and for the defense of fundamental values. So in this context, I believe a comprehensive import ban on products from the Xinjiang region uh, can be one possible step, but also we should discover other possibilities, including uh, expanded asset freezing and targeted sanctions against top officials of the Communist Party uh, who control the events in Xinjiang. Uh, but, but also we have to uh, really take a long, hard look on how we within the EU function in that regard. So I, I really think that uh, 
we should have a mandatory due diligence mechanism so that we can also ensure that no European company is uh, complicit uh, in contributing to human rights violations uh, nowhere down in their supply chain. Uh, we have to, we have a moral obligation, as I said before, to defend those who are vulnerable, those who are oppressed. And we should remember that the Chinese reaction uh, that you mentioned, Peter, came after the EU imposed sanctions first on a number of Chinese officials. Um, the, the, the tools we have are imperfect, uh, but we, we even with these imperfect tools, we can do more. Uh, and, and we in Parliament have this very important task, I believe, to continue uh, upholding the pressure on the uh, Council to move ahead with tougher sanctions, uh, even uh, in spite of some member states continuing to act if they are more loyal to Beijing compared to their, their own European community. Uh, so, so we have a long road ahead of us and also the powers of the institutions are imperfect. Mr. Budikoffer told uh, a lot of uh, interesting insights about this uh, earlier. But we just have to make better use of our economic leverage and more, more focus when we react to that. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, when it comes to economic relations, you both, both mentioned that um, there is a kind of criticism from advocates of, of uh, let's say, uh, classical free market solutions that uh, some kind of, let's say, restrictions on the trade between European Union and China uh, and, and some kind of protectionist approach of the, the European uh, economic development model uh, could lead to similar problems as, for example, when United States impose uh, economic uh, sanctions and tariffs practically on, on European uh, Union goods. So, Mr. Kanaf, how would you defend your position on, on defending uh, European markets from this kind of criticisms that it's it practically it's uh, globalization critical and and um, and and uh, and a solution that that can undermine uh, free trade and and has has a strong protectionist stance. Yes, uh, thank you. Of course, there is such criticism and uh, basically as, as a politician, as a party political stance, both at home and in the European Parliament, uh, I'm more of a free trade advocate. Uh, I believe that, uh, that free trade is important uh, both for wealth and for peace. Uh, however, uh, first of all, I think the last uh, at least two decades, and especially the Chinese example, uh, showed us quite painfully that perfect free trade does not exist. Uh, and uh, we don't have to jump into ideology, uh, but look practically what happens on the markets. Uh, is, it, uh, is it a perfect free trade when one partner is heavily subsidizing and the other is not subsidizing at all? Obviously, we have no, uh, no free trade. Uh, but uh, more importantly, it's obvious that uh, the present Chinese leadership is using uh, so-called free trade uh, for plainly political purposes. Uh, and uh, I'm certain that uh, each European country, but especially the union as a whole, because uh, we are limited within the single market, we don't have national trade uh, policies, uh, and that's for good, I'm, uh, I'm sure about that. Uh, we have the right uh, to defend both our market, uh, our economic independence and strength, but also uh, to promote our core values, as uh, already discussed. Uh, forced labor, uh, I would uh, easily use the term slave labor, uh, is not something that could produce goods for the European market. Uh, this is uh, really uh, extremely and definitely uh, against our basic human values. I wouldn't even say European values, but, uh, uh, but human values and understanding of human rights. We have a lot of dif differences between uh, 
between ourselves. Uh, uh, we have much more conservative and much more liberal groups within Europe and within each European party even. Uh, but when it comes to forced labor, I don't think we have differences. I think this is, uh, this is one of our basic understandings of life. Uh, so we certainly uh, have the right to object the import of products of uh, forced labor on the European market. We certainly have the right and I would say the obligation towards our citizens to defend the media freedom because media freedom is a human right of, uh, of European citizens and getting uh, uh, biased and fake information or explicitly dangerous information uh, is violation of their rights. I would give a, a, a quite recent example, uh, but what we see with the anti-vaccination campaigns in southeastern Europe, especially on the Balkans, is a real nightmare. In my country, in this present moment, we have plenty of vaccines uh, and uh, we face uh, a, a really terrifying reluctance, especially from the elderly, the most, uh, the most vulnerable, uh, to vaccinate themselves. And we all know it's, uh, it's due especially to malevolent propaganda in the media link both to Russia and China. Uh, so uh, free trade is free trade. Free trade is good. Uh, open markets are good, but uh, we need the instruments to defend from the abuse of free trade rules. Thank you. And we have uh, time for one last question. Uh, that is about the comprehensive, it's quite related to what, uh, to, to the issues of trade. Uh, what is the, your opinion on the, um, and I would turn to Ms. Chat now, uh, what, what is your assessment on the comprehensive trade agreement uh, on uh, with China? Uh, Mr. Butikofer's response to this question in typing it in was that it's, it's safe in the freezer, but I would like to Hear your thoughts on that as well. The European Parliament, just as a background, uh, played a, a, a very important role in putting this, this agreement on hold. Well, first of all, I have to say that I find it highly unfortunate that the German presidency concluded uh, this deal very ab abruptly at the end of last year after negotiations that appear to uh, have like still many years um, content ahead of uh, ahead of it and, and and this conclusion happened very rapidly uh, and exactly in the I don't know three weeks maybe when the transition was going uh, on between the Trump and the Biden presidency so I first of all would have preferred much more to wait until the incoming new US administration and the US and the EU will formulate a uh, joint strategy of uh, cooperation with uh, with China. Because I, I believe that this is something that we have to share a united front on. But uh, given the content of the, uh, of the CHI agreement, well, I also support free, free trade, but I also think that trade should not only be free, but also fair. And uh, in, in that regard, I, I, I find uh, quite a lot of loopholes uh, in, uh, in the original text. Uh, and, and also that this, uh, this deal is not a symmetrical one. So we do not grant, uh, give the uh, same uh, benefits to uh, China, uh, what the market access for instance, that we grant for Chinese companies are not comparable uh, to uh, many of the provisions we Europeans get from the Chinese side. It's very asymmetrical for us. Um, so I believe that there are like quite a lot of uh, points where this uh, agreement has to be remedied. Uh, for, for me, one of the most important things would be uh, a mandatory signatory of the I ILO conventions from the Chinese side and not only in the pledge to do that was something to actually happen in practice before we even consider moving forward with the deal. But uh, regardless of the content of the agreement, I think it's absolutely uh, not, uh, incomprehensible for me to ask uh, or just even to consider European Parliament voting for 
for this agreement when uh, members of, of it uh, are still being under sanction, also commission uh, or council bodies, uh, European citizens. So until these sanctions are not lifted from the Chinese side, I believe that no matter what kind of changes we uh, might enact uh, uh, during the negotiations, this uh, agreement cannot and won't be ratified. Thank you, and I think it's it's a, a nice nice thought to, to 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 close the event. One last remark: we had also a question from Kester Eddy on examples on how Taiwan dealt uh, so well with malevolent Chinese propaganda and other initiatives. I think it's Kevin Shives who will be able to respond this question well. So I will forward this question to him as far as I know, but I'm really not a Taiwan expert. There were, let's say, two, two most three very important uh, elements of the strategy. First of all, constant screening and monitoring of this information. Um, uh, second, uh, constant rebuttal and treating this information as 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 uh, Reinhard Butikov also referred to to the issue of 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 security and and as a security threat and not only as let's say an issue of of uh, of public communication and 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 free uh, speech and the third one as that I read is is a very comprehensive. Um, digital literacy education for the for the youngsters. But again, I will forward it to Kevin, and if he has anything more to tell about that, we will put it in the chat under under the the Facebook Live of the event. So, without further ado, thank you very much, Ms. Chat and and Mr. Kanaf, to being with us and sharing the thoughts. I think there is a lot of food for thoughts that we have to digest after this event. Also, even if he's away, thanks for. Uh, Reinhard Butikofer for, for being with us as well. Thanks for my colleagues for preparing the study that you can read uh, on, on the website. Uh, it was put in the chat. And also thanks for our partners for, for contributing to the study and even for some of them for being with us today. Thanks for National Endowment for Democracy. And last but very not least, two other colleagues that I have to mention who hasn't been mentioned yet. Thanks for um, Katalina, uh, Katalin Sitash and for Bella Zagonisuch for being with us and, and providing background support. So, and thanks for all of you for being uh, here with us today and wish you a very pleasant rest of the day and see you at our uh, future events. If you have any feedbacks, please share it with us. Goodbye. Thank you, goodbye.